Welcome back to the show. My guest today is Dr. Robert Kelly. Dr. Kelly is a consultant cardiologist. He is a lecturer at the Royal College of Surgeons. He is an advocate for lifestyle medicine and much, much more, which we'll get into in our conversation. So Dr. Kelly is a great example of someone who was on the busy treadmill of life. So stressed, overworked, and no time for family, no time for friends. But luckily, you know, given the work that he does, he realized where he was and where he would end up. So he made the decision to step off and refocus. Now, it wasn't easy, as you can imagine. So if you're in any way interested in genuine behavior change, that's both personally for, for yourself or to support your colleagues at work, then you're going to get a lot from Dr. Kelly's story. So the advice here that we speak about is evidence-based, it's easy to follow, and it's based on real life experience. So enjoy my conversation with Dr. Robert Kelly. Robert, hello and welcome to the Work Well podcast. Thank you, Brian. How are you today? How's life and how's work for you? Uh, life is very good. Um, it's great to have the COVID uh, behind us. Uh, the hospital have just taken down all the plastic screens this morning, so uh, it really signifies a big change. We're just waiting for the masks to come down. So uh, we're, we're moving forward, So uh, which is great. Excellent. Yeah, pro progress. Absolutely. Progress is being made, certainly. So listen, Robert, you're you're a, well. You've got a you know, a fantastic CV. There's there's quite a you've got a, quite a few balls in the air. I would say you're a, you're a consultant cardiologist, a lecturer at the RCSI, to name but a couple. And there's there's quite an entrepreneurial streak throughout your career. Could you maybe bring us up to speed on the on the career journey and maybe share some highlights? Absolutely. So I uh, am a cardiologist. I graduated from the College of Surgeons Medical School. I trained in cardiology. And then I worked abroad in, in, in the UK and in, in the United States, where I trained uh, the skills of putting stents into people for heart attacks and blocked arteries. But since that time, since I came back to Ireland, which is about 15 years ago, um, I've come to the realization that the real challenge is not in putting stents into people's arteries. It's about trying to fix the reason why they needed the stent put in in the first place. And uh, that's very apparent to me because I, one of the skills I've been a doctor is to learn how to listen to patients. So I put a lot of effort into listening to what the patients are saying. And that's really led to other entrepreneurial adventures, as you, as you mentioned. So when I returned to Ireland, I was always wanting to have a better business acumen because I'd set up in private practice. So I did an MBA, uh, an executive MBA. Now that was back in 2007, which is a really important time point in life because Disruptive innovation, all the connected health, all the telemedicine, the iPhone, the internet, that was really just starting off in this country. So, I mean, you know, in the, in the beginning of my career, the iPhone was launched in Ireland. So, I mean, most people think the iPhone's been around for 100 years, but it hasn't. <laughs> Facebook, LinkedIn, they only came out around the same time. So, yeah, you just yeah. imagine the impact that all that change has had on my career and on my patients. After the uh, MBA, I had some senior management roles in the hospital, but Listening more to patients, it was very apparent that the technology wasn't the uh, solution. The solution was more around content. It was more around helping people do things uh, to change their behavior. So more recently, I got involved in lifestyle medicine, which we're going to talk about. I also got involved in trying to become a health coach. And I wanted to find something that fitted with my time and something that was simple enough that patients could understand. Uh, so I learned how to become a habits coach through a group in America. I've also learned how to design behavior specifically around healthcare. So uh, that's where I'm at at the moment. And uh, it's been a great journey. I mean, it really has, the, the more the patients uh, give me information, the more I'm challenged to, to try and uh, find new things to try and help them stay well. Excellent. Yeah. And, and is, is it possible to say what a typical day looks like? Sure. Or would it, be, it, it would, it would. Okay. So, um, so over the last year, um, I must admit that my dad died about 14 months ago through natural causes. And one of my historical uh, bad habits was I would go back to work almost immediately or very shortly after that, give myself no downtime and uh, just take on more and more as a way to immerse myself. And when that happened, I realized very, very quickly in a short period of time that this was just the wrong way for me to continue, that I would want to be very careful for my own personal health. 
So I actually, a week after that, stopped doing virtually everything I do. Uh, so that was 14 months ago. Mm -hmm. um, I changed a lot of my approaches. I learned how to say no to things, uh, which was wonderful. I stepped off committees that I wasn't really getting anything out of or contributing much to, and there were a lot of those. Mm -hmm. And then what I've done more recently is try to condense my week so I can do things. So now I do clinics two days a week, which are Mondays and Fridays, which are big clinics seeing cardiology patients. On Tuesdays, I do procedures on patients, like putting stents and doing angiograms. Okay. And then Thursdays and Fridays, I try to protect my time to focus on this stuff and to focus on the, uh, the, the coaching, uh, writing, teaching, doing talks, uh, doing podcasts and things like that. And that's worked very, very effectively because it's ultimately, as you say, I've had to juggle my time a bit to do that. And then one of the things I've tried really, really hard to do in the period of time is also to look after my own personal health and self-care by keeping my weekends free. Because the danger in these jobs when you're very busy, you take a lot of work home with you or you take work home in the evening, you don't switch off. Or at the weekends, you've no time to see your kids, your spouse, everybody else and fit in other things because work gets in the way. And uh I think some of that also comes from being a little bit more organized here to actually let the doctor on call be the doctor on call for all the patients rather than giving me access because the downside about being in healthcare is you always feel responsible for other people mm -hmm. uh, and you kind of lose out on being responsible for yourself. Very good. Yeah, no, it does seem like a very kind of disciplined and structured week. I've, I've had a go at that myself a few times trying to or attempting to do that, but hasn't always worked out uh, as, let's say, as clean cut as that. Any, any advice in what you've learned in the last 14 months? How, how did you, like, saying, saying no to something is, is quite difficult. Have you, have you perfected it? Is this, do you prioritize, do you analyze? I know Derek Sivers, uh, a guy I follow, has a great line. It's either a hell yes or it's a no. Do you have anything as clear cut as that when you're making that decision? So I, I think for me, um, I, I kind of reached a, a crisis moment that I just had too much going on yeah. um, and, and there really was no room. There was nowhere to go. I mean, a lot of people are chasing their tails. In fact, everybody's chasing their tails at the minute at work and there's no way of either A, catching it or alternatively stopping doing it for a minute. I, I took the opportunity, even though it was a very short period of time after returning to work, just to stop. And I, I just stopped and I kind of worked it out what I was doing. My wife said to me, well, if it's not paying you, don't do it. Uh, I unfortunately felt, well, it is kind of maybe paying me at a longer term investment of, of yeah. return and in referral, whatever. But then I had to prioritize and kind of sit back and work out what I wanted to do. And a lot of that, in fairness, has led to me kind of running my own coaching programs here in, at work in the hospital uh, in, in kind of trying to get some clarity in my own mind as to what I actually want. I mean, we're all not getting any younger, so mm -hmm. you won't be able to do everything you want. Uh, and, and so the reality, you really do have to try and focus because if you can do that, then, then you can achieve an awful lot more. And, and the ironies of that was that I was able to turn around and say, well, I don't need this. I don't need this. I don't need that. And a few people do get agitated. But, you know, I was able to at least say, well, you know what? I've been under a lot of pressure. My, my father's died recently. Um, I, I really need to protect my time. And then it's, it's, it's like everything else. You just have to take one day at a time. You have to work at it. But ironically, somebody had the phrase I got from somebody else was, you can't say yes until you say no to things. So uh, I, I think that's a wonderful phrase in terms yeah. of, uh, of working out what is important and what's not important. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, ultimately you have to be happy in life. You, you can't just do everything because everybody else wants you to do it. You can't give up your own self-care so that a patient takes all the self-care that you need for yourself from you. So, because uh, otherwise, you know, one of the big challenges for healthcare as it is for everybody else is, we all just burn out, uh, yeah. and then we're, and then you know that leads to risks for what we do and treating everybody. But it also leads to personal health risks. Mm -hmm. Great, brilliant, brilliant advice there. And you know, as well, it sounds like as well as looking after your own health and well-being, it's it sounds like you're being, uh, on, you're more productive and efficient on what you have chosen to focus on as well. So, uh, you know, a positive positivity all around. You you touched on a health program, a coaching program at work. Could you dive into some more details on that? Absolutely. So um, during COVID, I spent a lot of time on Zoom like this. And so mm -hmm. I wanted to try and be innovative along the lines I had been uh, in coming up with ways that I could engage what I said was learning from patients. And big need around patients is actually getting them to change behavior. You know, uh, a colleague said to me the other day, you know, when a patient asked, am I fixed, was... Well, sorry, Dr. Kelly doesn't fix things. He mends things. He puts stents in your arteries. That mends the blockage. 
but it doesn't fix your heart. It doesn't fix your heart health. What fixes your heart health is you. You you need to stop smoking. You you need to be involved in your own care in terms of you know being responsible and and, and doing things about it. So you may know, that may involve exercise. That may involve your sleep, your stress. It may involve your eating habits, but. The, the, the point about that is that I discovered that nobody was teaching or, or educating or coaching patients. So I decided to try and do this just at the beginning of COVID and coaching patients through Zoom. I had done a lot of workshops online and webinars and found that there was a huge interest and the patient feedback was overwhelming. It really was fantastic. I principled it all on, on my learnings around habits and around behavior design. Mm -hmm. And then patients are great because they talk to other patients. That's how doctors get more patients. But the <laughs> other thing they do is some of them talk to the staff in the hospital. So when they spoke to the staff in the hospital, the staff in the hospital say, hang on a second, why can't you do that for us as well? Now, the staff in the hospital aren't my patients. They're my colleagues. The group I've been coaching, there's a number of groups I've been coaching over the last year who are largely senior management, they are middle managers, they are senior nurses, some of them work in different departments like IT. I haven't got to the consultants yet, that's a work in progress. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do a group coaching session where I do a Zoom call for an hour and a half uh, every week. They get the information around behavior change uh, in, in a video and other presentations to work on with some, some homework and practical work. And, and then we effectively work together as a group, which has been a huge impact. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, where there may be a member of the team that's not listening or just doesn't get it, other members of the group, I really try and encourage them to bring that person along and to bring that person up to speed. A lot of the staff are from all over the world. They have uh, tips or habits that they use in their life. So a lot of people do yoga who aren't from Ireland. A lot of people do very simple yoga, simple meditation techniques that only last five minutes as a great way to start out the day. Some of them exercise. One of the great things has been to get the group to go out to take because we all work here in the Beacon. A lot of them go out at lunchtime together for a walk. So they prioritize that, that when they put their computers down at say half 12, they go out for a walk. A lot of them eat together. Most of them actually help each other out. They become great sort of accountability buddies to help each other deal with challenges in life or getting on with each other or even what's written in an email that might signify your kind of frame of mind of the day. You could be you could be very annoyed, press click on your email, send something awful into the boss and, and the repercussions are huge. Whereas other members of the group have been great helping each other. So it's been it's been a great team effort to see that happen. It's more challenging to do that with patients, clearly, because they're not all in the same place. Uh, but the impact and the purpose has been to really try and help people become unstuck. Now, what I mean by that is I think everybody in this country and around the world can admit to the fact that they're on a treadmill, that they go to work, they come home, they go to sleep, they go to work, they come home, they go to sleep, and, and, and life is like that. And most people have lots of balls they have to juggle as well, and most of people are getting into trouble with that, and they have no idea how to just press the off button on the treadmill and literally step off it for half an hour, an hour. So a lot of what I've been coaching is in trying to achieve that, mm -hmm. and then I align that with all those different aspects of health that are important to try and help people improve that, and we just work towards different goals over, over time to do that. And the irony is that while the program runs for six weeks, there's not enough time in that. So I actually do a session once a month, every month after that, with whoever wants to show up within the group. And that keeps everybody going. But it's it's been incredibly successful and it's been incredibly positive. And ironically, when you start doing it for other people, you start doing it for yourself. Yeah. Uh, so, so you know, we, we're all smiley faced. I mean, everybody wants to know who I am. Everybody who I don't know is all my best friend again. It's it's <laughs> it's kind of I've become so open hearted as a consequence of doing things for other people in a way that I make a huge difference in their lives. We all get on an awful lot better. Their work productivity is much, much better. Everybody wants to know what's going on. Everybody wants to know what I'm giving everybody all of a sudden. Patients are aware of it. So mm -hmm. it's a really great way to trigger people to do something for themselves. And, uh, you know, so far, so good. So, so much in that, you know, when you were initially speaking, even before you mentioned the word, all I was thinking of was accountability. Like this, this group, this program is, is offering great accountability for people. And even for yourself, as you mentioned, like you're, you're part of that as well. And then the other thing was, uh, is leading by example. Uh, in a workplace setting so there's senior leaders in there as you mentioned there's a great mix of uh, seniority levels on the team so everyone is kind of leading by example getting just as simple as getting out for that walk at lunchtime or, or eating a healthy meal sharing meals with others whatever it might be and then almost the final point is kind of you uh, you're 
like you're giving, you're giving this uh, to your colleagues, but it sounds like it feels like you're getting so much more in return. And I kind of love that idea, maybe from the five ways to well-being. That you know, by you know, by giving, uh, it's actually it is actually a really great way. You know, you're not intentionally, but you're actually you do get so much back in return from that. Uh, so it, that sounds like a great program. And the the other thing then to say is, I see it all too often, unfortunately. Those that are, let's say, healthcare settings or well-being service providers, the people that are providing the, the healthcare and services for other people, for patients, they, they, they don't always look after number one. They don't look after themselves. So it's great to see that you're kind of initiating this program and it's being so successful there at the Beacon. I think one of the comments to make, Brian, is that since COVID, and everybody's aware of this, but particularly in the health system, everybody's even more aware of it is that the hospitals around the world are really struggling because a lot of the doctors have decided to leave the medical profession. Now, in the US, that's about 40 or 50% of the doctors are leaving the health system. In this country, it's not quite as high, but what we are struggling with is we're losing a lot of nurses. Mm -hmm. So we've lost about 25% of the nurses in the health system. Now, a lot of the nurses aren't Irish and they've returned home for other reasons. Mm -hmm. You know, the cost of living is very high. Or some of them have lost family members during COVID and they've gone over to become the breadwinner at home. Yeah. Uh, but we've lost a lot of that type of, of member of staff. That puts enormous pressure in the system to continue for the other 75% of people are still there. And, and I think the reality in that is that it's very hard to try and keep people together. It's very hard when you're working 10 times as hard, particularly because the needs haven't decreased to any degree. Mm -hmm. And I think so being able to offer and share what you, we were just talking about with staff is a good way to keep them interested. They are much more happy. They're much more productive and they want to share that with other people. And I think that improves your health as well. And so for me, that is really a huge, huge purpose in my life to give back a lot of what I'm learning. There's no point in me keeping it to myself. I want to share it with other people so they get as much out of it as I'm getting out of it. Excellent. Yeah. Brilliant. And we, so we need more and more initiatives like that in, in healthcare settings uh, and for well-being service providers. Hopefully this inspires many more to, uh, to, to do the same. Talk to me about the, the lifestyle medicine piece. That's, I mean, I've heard, I've heard it before. I've heard Dr. Mark Rowe speak about it quite often. Is, is, it, is it as simple as, you know, encouraging, let's say, people and, and healthcare professionals, doctors, GPs to prescribe, let's say, exercise? Good nutrition, uh, you know, social well-being uh, resources, as opposed to uh, medicine. So, um, Mark and I both uh, come from the same position in terms of lifestyle medicine. So, lifestyle medicine is an area of medicine. So, it's evidence-based. It's practiced by doctors. So, it's a doctor who's doing this. Like cardiology is for is hard stuff. Mm -hmm. um, the lifestyle medicine is about the ability to prevent which is very like preventive cardiology, but also to treat and to potentially reverse illnesses. Now, illnesses are chronic diseases, which are conditions such as blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, obesity, lung conditions, heart conditions, all of which, believe it or not, you can prevent because there are factors in your life that you contribute to why you get them. So when it comes to having a heart problem, as an example, 20% of your risk comes from your genes. So your family may have a history of heart disease, but that only gives you one fifth of the risk that you'll have it. What gives you four fifths of the risk is, do you smoke? Do you drink too much alcohol? Are you physically inactive? Are you having trouble sleeping? Is stress, and I mean chronic stress, a big factor in your life? Are you isolated, as you mentioned, which is a big challenge post COVID in particular, uh, and what's your diet like? Are you eating a lot of the wrong foods that would contribute to cholesterol, sugar and diabetes, salt and high blood pressure? Because if you are, you can either not do those or change those, or you can make changes that potentially you can prevent having a heart problem. You can treat a heart problem. You may need some tablets depending on your circumstances, mm -hmm. but you can reverse a heart problem. And there's good evidence of that. You can reverse diabetes by taking sugar out of your diet. You can reverse blood pressure by making dietary changes. You can also reverse heart disease through the combination of exercise, changing what you're eating, and also some of the more social aspects, the stress management aspects. So Mark and I come from the same position. Mark is a GP. His emphasis is directly in primary care. My emphasis is as a cardiologist uh, by the same uh, exact same message. 
And I see uh, just on your on your profile there that there's uh, you you work with is it the undergraduate uh, team at the RCSI or undergraduates at the RCSI on a on a lifestyle medicine teaching program. So one of the great things is that there's an excellent lifestyle medicine program for doctors that's run by Harvard. It's run in June of every year. There's one coming up again, if you look it up. Very good, informative about what's going on in, in lifestyle medicine. Now, the challenge with that, obviously, is the American-based approach to lifestyle medicine is a bit different to the Irish-based approach. But the point to highlight here is that in lifestyle medicine, um, what you're trying to do is get people to make small changes. Yeah. You mentioned giving people a prescription. It's great. The problem is that if you're a doctor... People see you as you give a prescription. That does not mean the patient will take it. So there's a huge aspect around learning how to coach patients as part of lifestyle medicine. We talked about the fact that I not just talk the talk, but I do walk the walk as well, which is important. A lot of other people don't do that. And so the, the real critical factor is to coach patients as part of what you do in lifestyle medicine. The other part of lifestyle medicine is really fascinating. The definition is that it encourages self-care. So the doctor has to be talking the talk and walking the walk because most patients will actually follow that. When my patients think that I'm looking well, if I tell them I'm active, if I'm engaged, they're much more likely to try and be like me. Mm -hmm. One of my patients told me about a year ago, so Dr. Kelly, she's one of the patients on my coaching program, actually. She said, you know, when I first met you, you're the most stressed out individual I ever met. And I kind of said, oh, my God, I really am. I'm, I'm, I'm just something. I'm, I'm, I'm missing something here. I'm not getting it yeah. right. Then I coached her about stress. She says, I don't know what's happened to you, Dr. Kelly. I mean, you're an entirely different person. Uh, so I, I, I do think that, you know, that aspect is important. So when I did the course in America, I engaged with the leaders of that course and I asked them to come to Ireland and help us establish lifestyle medicine in the College of Surgeons. So there's a lady called Beth Frazies, F-R-A-T-E-S, who's very much a pioneer in lifestyle medicine in the U.S. She came to the College of Surgeons and we set that up. So, so there was a lot of people in the College of Surgeons from the psychology department in particular who were always very interested in lifestyle medicine. And in fairness to the college, probably one of the first medical schools ever to do this, they have fascinating lifestyle programs in different aspects of, of, of their organization. So, for example, the guy who runs the gym has a lifestyle medicine program for the students who use the gyms. In the College of Surgeons, they have a special gym for uh, non-Irish nationals who don't want to exercise in the same room as men. So they have different lifestyle medicine programs for them that include all those lifestyle pillars. The college has eating options that relate to lifestyle medicine. They have active, so they have active internal initiatives that really breed that lifestyle culture. Most people are aware of the positive psychology department do a lot of public lectures. They run a lifestyle medicine course that I actually teach on us through positive psychology. And then I've been involved with a lot of them trying to uh, build lifestyle medicine into the program. So one of the initiatives, which I mentioned, is the idea of teaching medical students lifestyle medicine. And one of the fascinating things on that is, do you teach the consultants or do you teach the, the undergraduate uh, pre-meds? Because unfortunately, as we all know, trying to get our parents to change their lifestyle, or even me, is a little bit more challenging than starting off with a very budding want-to-be doctor in pre-med. So we felt the best place to position lifestyle medicine was actually at the very bottom of that chain, get the medical students on board and, and live with the purpose that in six years time, when they become doctors, that lifestyle medicine will become part of the questions they'd ask patients and would also become part of the intervention. And in that way, we could create a momentum that would really, really make a difference in lifestyle medicine for patient care. Excellent. Yeah. Um, so... You know, in the future, well, I've, I've heard anecdotally this is happening already, but, you know, in the future, will we see, you, know, you go to your GP and you might, you know, with a, whatever condition it might be, but uh, you you're leave with a prescription for to attend your local park run or to, uh, you know, you've got a certain uh, nutrition, a kind of diet to follow, that, that kind of idea. And maybe, maybe will, of course, there's medicine is required uh, when necessary, but it's that kind of idea that they're the prescriptions uh, the lifestyle medicine style prescriptions. So I, I think there's an important uh, comment to make in, in terms of prescription because patients, when they get prescriptions, uh, as I said, don't necessarily follow through. Yeah. If you prescribe, say, you must do this exercise, this frequency, this intensity. Uh, there's a lot of people, as we know, even in the workplace, who are the people who already champion exercise, but they're not the challenge. It's the 85 or 90% of people who don't do any of it. So 
it does require a little bit more ingenuity in terms of trying to get people to change their behavior. And, you know, I said I became a, a behavior coach and I've also learned the principles around habits uh, and around behavior design. So one of the things about getting people to change the behavior beyond the prescriptions is really getting people to do little things. So it's exactly right. Get, go out and go for a walk in the park for five minutes every Saturday morning. Just do that. But you'll only do it if somebody triggers you. So you might have to get out of bed, put the runners on, then go out for the walk for five minutes acknowledge the fact that you're doing it and come back and resist the temptation to go for an hour. Don't do that initially because what you find is a week later, you won't want to do it. You'll come up with some excuse. You want to do as small as possible just to get it right. And then you want to build on it. And that, that applies with everything, every type of lifestyle behavior. So what I've tried to do is at least give people that say, after I get out of bed on a Saturday morning, I put on my runners, I go for a walk. I'll acknowledge that. And that's your prescription. Uh, and, and so I use it that way. And then you just build out from that. And I keep in touch with you to see what progress you're making. It's very important on the accountability factor that you actually write it down somewhere in a journal or on a little. One of the great tricks is to take the calendar out and X off each of the days that you've actually done it. Mm -hmm. And to acknowledge how you're feeling so it reinforces you. With the walking and those park runs, they're great because you can do them with other people. But, mm -hmm. you know, if you're new to it, you might want to bring a friend along. Uh, and I, I think that. You know, that group dynamic where you share, you can share a lot of other issues in your life. I mean, one of the great things about going for a walk uh, or going in a park run is you might be able to do it with some work colleagues. You might be able to de-stress a little bit in the conversation. Uh, you might be able to bring up other things. Or, you know, I, another example, I had a patient during the week who has a lot of personal issues with his wife. And I said, well, you know, you're, you know, one of the challenges, he's stressed. He's arriving home late from work. He's eating all the wrong food. There's an extra bottle of wine. And I said, well, you know, probably the stress factor is a big trigger here. So why don't you kind of maybe go for a walk, but bring your wife with you? Maybe take your wife for a walk for half an hour, say after dinner, you both put the shoes on, you both go out, you both engage in a little bit of a conversation. And, you know, when you do those things over time, you build on them. So one of the good examples, you want to lose weight. The best way to lose weight is lose about two pounds a week and not anymore. Because yeah. if you can lose two pounds a week, you build a habit. Whereas if you force a, pa a stone in in a week, unfortunately, you tend to lose the habit very quickly. Mm -hmm. So the reality is that, you know, you lose two pounds a week, you do three months of that. Well, there you go. You've got 12 weeks, 12 by two. You've got 24 pounds. You're down over a stone. And the reality to that is it takes you about 60 days to really ingrain that habit. And so therefore, you know, it's the same with everything else. Start with the two minute walk, build it to three, to four, to five. Uh, but doing it that way, when you make those behaviors easy to do, you'll tend to apply them. And I think that's the way, at least that's the way I practice to try and get those people to make changes in behavior. Excellent. Yeah. So small steps consistently over a period of time, that mm -hmm. is what potentially can lead to really great results in, the, in the long run. Yeah. Absolutely. You, you touched on a very interesting point there uh, in the area of workplace health promotion. Uh, if we're organizing a, like an intervention and initiative you know, it could be anything if it's if it's a couch to 5k program if it's a nutrition talk it's very likely that it's the people that are already interested in that area or are already fairly fit and healthy that will that will attend or, or sign up to those any any suggestions or advice and how do we how do we encourage how do the hr leaders or the, you know, the well-being leaders in the workplace encourage those that perhaps need the intervention the most to get involved so a little bit back to what I just said about mm. the idea of behavior design. Behavior. So, so, so behavior depends on three factors. It depends how motivated or how much willpower you actually have to do something. Now, we all know that doesn't work because on the 1st of January every year, the population decide they're going to take up exercise, they join the gym, they put all their money into that. <laughs> and usually by the 22nd of January, you're never in the gym again. You put a lot of money in, you're peed off, and you just stop exercising. The same is true for smoking. The same is true for eating. It's universal. So motivation doesn't work to change your behavior. So you can load your employees with loads and loads of talks and loads and loads of you must do this, you must do that. Have a, a healthy meal on a Thursday, and there you go. You're all healthy. So, you know, you ask yourself, why is it that I, I've done some work with a, a large corporate organization in this. Um, they have a small little coffee shop at their front desk in their main entrance to their, their, their management building. And what they tell me is that everybody eats the donuts on Thursday, Friday. And so they split the week in two. So Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday, you're healthy. Thursday is a weekend. Monday is a weekend. So you're totally unhealthy. So you can see the message doesn't get through on the behavior aspect. So. 
The other aspect to this is that the behavior is very dependent on your ability or how easy it is for you to do the behavior. And what that depends on is, A, can you afford to do it? So, you know, if you're going to go for a walk, you need a pair of shoes. You need to have two legs at work. You, you don't want to be stuck with arthritis so that walking is just not appropriate for you and there isn't an alternative. You want to make it something that you like doing. You want to make it something that works with what you want to achieve. And ultimately, if you get those things right, or even if there's one weak link in that chain, the other three or four things, once you have them in place, will help you get across the line. So you're making behavior so simple and so easy to do, and you're acknowledging that it's having an effect, that that is the way you change behavior as opposed to pushing information and beating up on people. You know, the big challenge, healthcare is a good example. I tell a patient, you know, you must do this, you must do this because you're going to have a heart attack. Most people forget every single bit of it when they leave the office. I mean, it's uh, notorious the way patients, particularly men, go home to their spouse and say, what did Dr. Kelly tell you about the eating habits, darling? He says, oh, he said it's fine. He says, I'm all right to have a couple of pints, maybe not every night. Uh, and, and, you know, we can stick with the desserts. He said, that's absolutely grand. And so, mm -hmm. you know, patients have their own way of translating what I say. And one of my mentors said, you know, the problem with information, it's a bit of a fallacy when it comes to what you tell patients. And I do realize that people just don't remember it. And so, you know, the other interesting aspect of life is if you look at all those billboards to tell you to stop smoking and slow down and speed in your car. They have a tiny, tiny impact. They're looking at the impact 1% of the population. So I, I, I think the reality, you have to teach people how to change behavior. So I, I think in the workplace, you have to be very creative and you have to come up with initiatives that way. And you know, patients will tell me stories about what they do or what they've learned from other people. Patients who aren't as physically active as the, the champion marathon runner who happens to work in purchasing, for example. So I, I, I think they'll, you know, little tips like uh, one of my patients, great story where he learned from a colleague that for the hour long meeting, you stop the meeting at 45 minutes, switch off, and you have 15 minutes before the next meeting comes off to go and do something. That might be just walking outside the front door. That might be having a, a bottle of water. That might be getting down on the floor in your office and doing something that involves physical activity, or you might meditate, or you might do something of that nature. But ultimately, it's personal self-care time not to be disturbed. One of the other things he also does is at five o'clock of every single day, he has an instruction to his secretary uh, not to be disturbed, that he's not available. He turns his phone off and he goes for a walk for one hour. Now, he's got in to do this over the last year and a half, and he's built it up very, very slowly, but he got that from another colleague. So he's able to factor in or schedule in his well-being. And so, you know, I think it is a cultural aspect to the workplace. I think you have to be more internal in terms of dealing with the issues, as opposed to sending people off, for example, to, you know, the problem with the employee assistance programs, as example, is if you have a stress problem, you get told to go off and do a coaching program or do a psychology phone call outside the workplace, you know, you automatically can see that, you know, the employer may not care as much about you as part of the team. They care more about you going off and solving your own problems. Mm -hmm. That's the problem with well-being is that we're all expected to do it ourselves. When ultimately what works best, as I said, is if we do it collectively together. And there's a lot of good stuff out there recently about trying to encourage people internally to help each other to solve their problems, trying to build up the culture around health within companies mm -hmm. and trying to get people to work that way. Because we all know if you get your mental health and your physical health right, you work better, you show up for work better, you tend to produce more presenteeism and you also tend to be much more productive. And in our hospital, it retains staff. So you know, it, 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 it's really, really obvious. And yes, it's really, really challenging. And so you have to create ways to make it as easy as possible and as fun as possible. And so a lot of the stuff I've learned around the behavior design teaches that. So it's, it's uh, you know, it, there's a great opportunity there. And I'll just say there's, there's one or two organizations out there, um, both international organizations that have been in the press of late, who've made huge initiatives in terms of, so the example of the patient where you give a little bit of protected time to yourself, um, so Fujitsu, the Japanese uh, company, have a recent article in, in an English uh, in the Financial Times talking about that. And, I'm, I'm uh, speaking. I'm speaking to Kelly uh, very soon, who's the head of well-being at Fujitsu. Yeah, it's a, it's an excellent article. And then the other one is if you look at Whole Foods. So uh, the Mackey, who's the CEO of Whole Foods, uh, published his uh, annual review recently and told the uh, staff in the world that he was going to retire from Whole Foods. Now. 
Whole Foods, as people may not know, is this very large organic food uh, company that was picked up by Amazon a couple of years ago. And has been very, very successful at trying to get people to make more, better choices from having what they eat. So the CEO has decided that after this, he's going to move into the lifestyle medicine space because he's really disgusted at the fact that most Americans are so unhealthy, despite the fact that he's selling what he would consider relatively healthy food. Mm -hmm. But one of the things he has done is that internally in the company, they create a space for their employees to go on a week-long program around their health, not specifically their well-being, not a retreat, not a send-off on a holiday, but specifically around their well-being. They invest in their staff's lifestyle, medicine choices, trying to get people to make the changes that we discussed. And he really wants to do it because he feels the health system is letting everybody down and he's going to lose employees for exactly the reasons that we spoke about. Uh, so it, it's good to see that people are taking the initiative because the other thing you can see post-COVID, unfortunately, is that our health system with losing employees, with the overwhelm of waiting lists, with everything else that's there. And as I said, you know, all these factors contribute to such a burden of disease. They're really going to need the help of a lot of corporations to help uh, encourage people or help to be, make people more healthy. And, and I mean, you know, there's a win-win for everybody here. Mm -hmm. Some great examples of leaders leading by example there. And you touched on something that's really important that I, I try to promote, and that's around the idea of building a culture of health in the workplace. I mean, you can, you can throw money at fantastic interventions and guest speakers and celebrity guest speakers, but it's the, it's the day to day behaviors and actions and the norms within an organization, you know, usually demonstrated, led from the top is what leads to uh, building a culture of health, a culture in the organization. So you're absolutely right there. And I just come in on that just to yeah. say, I have done that with a couple of corporates in Ireland and that's exactly the challenge. The challenge is if you, uh, if you delegate well-being to, to, to certain members in a company or maybe like the champions who want to get yeah. everybody else running with them, it doesn't uh, find its way through to most of the employees unless the senior management are actually part of that. Yeah. And I treat a lot of senior management and senior executives as patients. And I can see that because this feedback comes back from them. But they're all so busy that they don't make time for it. So, you know, the culture is missing in terms of health. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think the other aspect of that that's really important is though a lot of the methods that I use can be taught. Uh, they can be taught in terms of organizations in very, very simple ways to yeah. identify those little behaviors that relate to specific health goals that people have. But I also think in terms of culture and one of the great glories about having an MBA is you get a certain insight in this is that uh, I, I think a lot of companies have these missions and visions about, say, they're serving other people or they want to be seen as the best in healthcare. The best example I put my hand up and say are hospitals. You go into a hospital, the canteen is the most unhealthy diet you've ever seen in your life. Mm -hmm. The staff are all of different sizes. They're all busy. They're not. We are probably one of the most unhealthy group of people. Uh, whereas we should really be internally the most healthy type of people and imparting that on patients. And I think there's, you know, there's every reason that health is a great opportunity uh, as a value to an organization in terms of having healthy employees and aligning that with your, your vision and your mission so that, you know, if you, we look after our employees, our employees are very healthy, we, we, we nurture our employees because you know that your employees will be more productive, which is what you want. But ultimately, you're supporting your staff in a way that everybody's more healthy, which is good for every aspect of your life. It's it's so true. Like I, mean, I, I still can't get my head around the fact that there's say in workplace health promotion, you know, companies that that provide these services to organisations, but yet they don't even have an internal program themselves themselves looking after their own colleagues. I mean, in, in the hospital example is a great is a great one as well. I, if I, if I have the choice, I want to go to the hospital uh, where the, the people are, are healthy, the staff are healthy and fit and, you know, stress for, as, as stress-free as possible. So I think it, it just makes so much sense to, to look after your people because your people will look after, after your clients and your patients. Just, I, I just want to ask you this one. I'd say you get asked this a lot. Uh, do, do you put, a lot of people put a time on how long it takes a behavior to become a habit and there's lots of, you know, research on this and you actually you mentioned january 22nd which of course is one day after the three weeks uh after christmas it, i'm guessing is, is it person dependent though really it just depends how long that becomes kind of a natural thing for someone to do or, or or is it possible to put to put an actual date on that 
I, I think the challenge is if you are totally dependent on willpower, uh, that's person dependent. I mean, some people are just able to stop smoking. Other people aren't. Yeah. But, but I mean, everybody needs to. So you have to create ways that make it easier. So in the stop smoking example, you have all these gums and sprays and everything else to try and help you do that. Or you can read uh, a certain person's book that will help you. Uh, or you do other treatments. But, but the point is it's the exact same. So some of it's very person dependent. Uh, and unfortunately, the motivation doesn't last. That's well established. So I, I think when you can work out to make life so easy for yourself, one of the great ways, for example, to eat more healthy is to put healthy food in your fridge. Fill your fridge with fruit and vegetables. Don't have a bar of chocolate yeah. and, all the, and all the other things. If you're a smoker, get rid of the ashtrays. Get rid of the little hidden cigarettes. Get rid of these things. You'll always have temptation in your life. Mm -hmm. But if you make it easier for you to make other decisions or you learn little tips about slowing down uh, so that you don't have to jump into the temptation, you'll get there. Yeah, they say it takes 66 days. There's other habits book. It says it takes a year. Mm -hmm. It is very person dependent. But I do think, you know, I know for a fact, I've done loads of diets. I love playing around the diets to see which ones work better, to see who, how you can manipulate the behavior. Some of them work really, really well, but the, the, the success is down to support. It's down to having accountability. It's down to documenting it. So you have a plan how to do it. So you're, you'll get a habit through a plan. You won't get a habit by just saying, oh, I must do it today. Oh, I'm not. <laughs> you know, I mean, there, there's, you know, I have a bottle of water. One of the things I find at my desk is, if I put the bottle of water beside my laptop, I'll drink it. If I put it two feet underneath the table, I probably won't touch it. And so, you know, there's an awful lot of nudges that you, that you need. There's a lot of effort that you need. But, I mean, it's like, you know, one of the big challenges with behavior and with everything you do in life is that unless you do something about it, for all the thought that you have and for all the ideas about, oh, I must be healthy. Or, no, I know I need to do that, Dr. Kelly. And I know it makes a big difference. And it's great you know that, but do something about it. Do something about it now. Stop putting it off. So, uh, you know, and so, I think that's the challenge. That's that's the big, big challenge. So, so no, nudge theory, and that can work if you're, uh, like for an organization, making the healthy option in the canteen, the easy option, but it can work for the individual then as well. You, you know yourself, buy the healthy food in the supermarket. Don't leave the crisps and the snacks there because you're, you're just going to you're just gonna dip into them at nighttime uh, potentially. So a lot we can do individually and, and at an organizational level then as well. And I, I think one of the challenges is that you have to take self-responsibility. I think one of the interesting things yeah. with my program is that my the feedback is about self-awareness and realizing, oh my God, I didn't realize... This led to this, led to this, so that the stress is making me eat worse or drink more, et cetera. And there are little things, or maybe I didn't realize that the stress is the origin of what I actually need to do is to learn how to sit down and talk to my wife in an open way. You know, just there are things like yeah. that. Maybe there are issues within work. And yes, all the other things balance out and they're good for me. But I, I, I think you have to learn to take one day at a time. I, you know, I mean, we'd all love to lose all the weight by the end of the week. We'd all love to be the marathon runners and everything else. We'd all love the stress to go away. Mm. But I mean, the reality is you pick up most of these habits over decades. Yeah. One of the big things about habits I forgot to mention is that if you lose the run of yourself for three or four days, you'll lose the habit quicker than you'll actually change the habit. So it's really mm. easy in the space of four or five days, you're not doing anything to lose the whole purpose of what you were doing. And so... Again, where you're trying to influence behavior is, you know, when your motivation is very low and you're having a crap day and it's raining outside, once you've made the behavior so easy and you're doing, say, the two-minute walk, you put on your shoes, you know that you grab the umbrella or you know that you might like the rain, that you can just go outside and walk for the two minutes. But the mm -hmm. point is you've done the behavior because it was easy to do. So, you know, I, I think you've got to be, you can't beat yourself up. Yeah. You gotta keep trying. They always say that if you fail, if you have a bad day yesterday and I didn't go for a walk, well, that's fine. That was yesterday. Today's a new day. Go and do it. So it's yeah. whereas if you make another excuse today as to say you leave that for four or five days, I'm afraid it'll be very difficult to, to kind of pick it up again. So yeah. uh, so so make it as easy as possible and try and, and, and be consistent with it then as well. I, I try to run a social enterprise called Park Kit, and I its idea is to promote the, the importance of resistance exercise. Uh, but it's it's there's no one kind of lifting heavy weights or you know running marathons or anything like that it's really really simple uh short workouts designed to show how simple it can be but the idea is we want to reward consistency we want to reward people for coming back week on week let's say with a free coffee after five weeks a t-shirt after 10 weeks this kind of idea it's just purely rewarding consistency and nothing else 
But uh, I think the other thing that's important, you know, I mean, if you want to change your, if you never exercised before in your life, one of the things that people may not realize is if you sit in your arse all day and do nothing, you up the risk of a heart attack by about 10%. Yeah. And you know that you can pick out what that person might look like. But the other thing is if you work from home and you sit on your desk all day working for 10 or 11 hours and you do this as your new way of living, I'm afraid you're in the same risk category. Mm -hmm. Or if your children are those kids who sit in front of video games for eight or 10 hours, they're also in a risk category that ups their health risk. So, yeah. you know, you can do something as simple as just turning the computer off, turning the TV off, going outside, sitting in the garden. You know, it's just about making choices. They're not decisions. You don't have to come up with excuses or reasons. They are choices that you just have to make that I'm not going to eat this. I'm going to eat something else. I'm going to step outside rather than sitting down. I'm going to turn the TV off actually an hour earlier than I normally would so I can sleep tonight. I'm going to choose to go to bed earlier. I must share with you one very interesting thought thing I heard yesterday on the radio, which was uh, the idea of your frame of mind and being more positive every day. And one of those things is that you feel tired every day. And if you reframe to that to saying, I'm going to go to bed at 10.30 tonight, night, where your usual time going to bed might be 11 o'clock is the way you feel. So there's, instead of saying I'm tired, I say, I'm going to go to bed at 10.30 tonight. Or maybe it's Saturday, I'm going to go to bed at 10.30 tonight. So instead of going through your mind, I'm tired, I'm miserable, I'm having a crappy day, all those other bad habits come around, you really shift the whole conversation. So you do the exact same with other things. I'm going to go for my walk, I'm going to do this. Where, you know, so it's, it's all about little steps. And then I think where you improve on that, your type of resistance programs, your consistency, you do have to give yourself little rewards, but you have to pick healthy rewards. So you don't reward yourself for losing weight by going to a certain fast food chain and stuffing yourself with their food. That's not what you do. If you're making progress in walking, you might buy yourself a fancy pair of shoes because you don't have the runners like somebody else does. Or mm -hmm. maybe you buy yourself a set of those wire, the, the, the wireless earphones to, to, to exercise on. But I think that you, know, you, you do need those little things to, to keep you going. I, I actually I saw you speak in person at the RCSI. It was a great series on. I think it was just before lockdown. Uh, it might have been late 2019 or early 2020, and it was on the subject of physical activity. You gave a great talk at that. And actually, one of the things I do remember from that was you spoke about even if you do have a good exercise habit, you can't reward yourself, or you 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 you're still at risk if you sit for the rest of that day entirely at work in the car. Uh, on the couch when you come home, you're still at risk uh, of, of cardiovascular disease because you're actually so sedentary, even if you are getting your 45 minutes of a run or a gym session in. Uh, so there was, I think you highlighted some of these. There was a BBC article about uh, sitting is a new smoking. There was beware of the chair, some kind of campaign. The Irish Heart Foundation had a campaign as well, like a warning, heavily seated area. So it's just, and the thing is, possibly in part uh, thanks to that lecture i'm actually i'm going to stand i'm recording this at a, my standing desk here uh, this morning so th thanks for that great advice uh, uh, that time you, you also spoke about the the minimum the, the physical activity guidelines and i think there was healthy ireland research was just said at the time i think most irish people do not meet the minimum standards for physical activity guidelines i think it's the 150 minutes uh, cardiovascular activity and two resistance sessions per week which most people don't actually uh, aren't actually aware of uh, would you say have we improved on those numbers since since the pandemic there was an initial kind of uh, walking phase and cycling phase and any thoughts on that have you have you made progress since your since your talk so let me just pick up on the first comment you were making about uh, sitting down even though you're doing your kind of exercise i mean one of the tricks i have after i see a patient is to let the patient out of the room and do something that relaxes me now you know if you open the door and saw me down the floor doing one or two press-ups as a way to build up a press-up habit you'd be laughing at me but mm -hmm. i have a thing on my watch as well which has me stand up every couple of minutes so yeah. i mean I, I think you build in those little behaviors you grow them out they're they're, they're positive steps to, to make you more healthy i, I think that's critical now, in terms of exercise and getting people to do the guideline, so the guideline is that you would exercise moderate pace, which is important, mm -hmm. uh, for 30 minutes every day. Now, other people will reframe that and say that you do 10,000 steps. Now, that is as a minimum. Yeah. So actually, most people, when you talk to them a couple of years on, are saying you should be doing about 16,000 steps. Uh, now, 16,000 steps will take you longer than 30 minutes. Uh, the other thing is moderate pace. So moderate pace means you are just about able to talk to the person beside you. It's mm -hmm. not a stroll. So there's, it is important, even if it's a stroll, to get you up because it's better than doing nothing. 
but it's also important that you get out there and do something. And, you know, if you are very busy and you have to push it to a situation like that you do is uh, 75 minutes on one Saturday and the other 75 minutes on a Sunday, that's also fine. It's also fine if you take the bike out or you play a sport. Believe it or not, the sports are really, really good for your heart health. So, you know, they're important. In terms of whether things are changed, I think we all observed during COVID that people are out more moving around and doing things. There seems to be more people around. Now, that could be just me because I'm in tune with the subject and it's the same group. One of the comments I made recently was the concept that people are running away from their health. Um, the reason I made the comment is that while there are a lot of people exercising, and I have lots of patients who do exercise, unfortunately, some of them come in with heart problems. And you kind of go, well, hang on, they're healthy, they're well. But the reality is a lot of them are using exercise to compensate for the fact that they have a huge amount of personal stress going on in either the workplace or at home, and they're not actually dealing with it. That's why I gave the example earlier on that you have to be a little bit more creative. For example, if you want to go out for a brisk walk in the evening and you have a lot of stress at home, but well, then perhaps take your wife with you and talk to her. Now, I mean, the moderate pace in, in terms of being able to hold a conversation, but at least do something creative. Yeah. If you're in the workplace, perhaps the way you could have your meeting as you walk, perhaps you could go out and bring the head of HR with you and you could go for a walk or you could meet, bring your secretary for a walk and talk to her about things. So, I mean, it's just, it's about making healthy choices mm -hmm. that you, you align with everything you do in life um, as a way to do it because we all come up with excuses. And I, I think that... Uh, I think it is important to try and follow through on those, those, those guidelines. Uh, exercise is great because there are guidelines. Unfortunately, the other areas, it's not a, a, as clear as that. But, uh, but I, I do think the value of exercise. And, you know, what you do in terms of resistance is also very important because it's not just cardiovascular. It's also important. Of balance is another exercise that's extremely important. So I mean, one of the things you could do in the office, right, I could do between patients, is stand on one leg for one minute. Great thing to try and learn how to do. Quite a difficulty. Try and close your eyes doing that. Yeah, and close your eyes doing that. <laughs> the other one is do a couple of squats, which is very good for, for, for resistance, or do a press-up or a push-up, or just do it against a chair if you're just starting off to doing it. But the point about it, doing it every day in between squats, or even that 10 minutes short of the meeting time. And, and I do yeah. think, you know, even when you go shopping, that you lift the bags of uh, uh, the shopping basket bags, or the other thing is that if you say you play golf, is you carry the golf bag as opposed to pulling a trolley. So, I mean, you can go on and join the gym if that's the type of person you are. You don't have to do that. You can talk to other people to help you out. You can hook up with you. Uh, but the point is that you're doing something as opposed to nothing. And if you want to get the most benefit that you build to the 30 minutes or you build to the 14,000 steps, you don't have to do the 14,000 steps today. Brilliant. Yeah. Excellent advice. Uh, fantastic knowledge. I mean, you'll have to get this all down in a book, Robert, or if I'm not mistaken, maybe you have already, have you? So I've just done that. I've just finished writing a book. Thank you very much. It's, called, <laughs> it's actually called Getting to the Heart of a Healthier You. Right. Uh, it's, it's looking for a publisher at the moment because it's a, it's a shorter book that's easier and sticks with my simple, easy principles of, of effectively what I just spoke about. But it's, yeah. it's targeted at everybody with the uh, challenge that trying to engage people more in their own health. I mean, a big challenge that I've always had through my career is trying to empower more people to prioritize their health. And I think that that can come from where you work. It can come from who you are, where you've grown up, who your family are, mm -hmm. uh, and all those conversations that you have. But then I also have show people how to use those behavior change or the behavior design methods and ways to make changes in the different areas of their health or their lifestyle that are relevant to them um, and show them how to complete that. And in fact, the physical activity uh, uh, aspect of health is, takes a big emphasis within the book in terms of trying to help people to, uh, to, to get that right. But the same is true of every other pillar that's also covered. Excellent. Yeah, I mean, the, the amount of knowledge you've shared today, I mean, I can't imagine why uh, a publisher wouldn't wouldn't jump at the opportunity to get that out there. And I love the idea. I love the fact that it's, as you mentioned, is concise, as concise uh, as possible. That reminds me, I just, I heard Daniel Pink speak recently on a podcast. I, lo I love his book, Drive. But he spoke about his, his new book, uh, the philosophy around the writing of his new book. And he said he, he writes the first draft. And then when he's reviewing it, Every single word has to fight for, for its life to remain in that, in that book. He, wa it's, he wants it to be as concise, as impactful, and as, as efficient as possible. And there's absolutely no kind of fluff at all. There's no, there's no need for any kind of padding at all. It's just straight to the point. And it sounds like your book is the same.
but but my my message out there is uh, I, I gave that talk about exercise. I gave another one about eating, and I was asked at the beginning of the talk, "What would I like as the outcome?" And I said, "I'd like one person in the room to make a positive, healthy change in their life tomorrow, where they haven't made it before." Mm -hmm. and so the same remit is there in terms of meeting patients, doing talks with you, doing a book. Yeah, is to get one more person or a hundred more people each day to make more positive, healthy choices in their life. Well, there was there was a lot of people in the room that day, and I'm sure they all left with with a lot of great uh, information and, and made some healthy choices off the back of it. And this, this standing desk is, uh, is, is test. There's, there's one choice at least. Robert, thanks so much for your time. I normally finish by asking guests, you know, how are, are they managing to spend time to look after your, their own well-being? But I think we've possibly covered that. Yeah, I think you're doing quite a bit as it is. But I can always do more and so can <laughs> everybody else. Yeah. I, you know, I have started to go back to doing a bit of running. I ran last Saturday, I kept it to 20 minutes. I felt I could go on further, but I tried to stop that with the idea I could do more. I went out on Sunday. I've been out doing stuff like playing golf with my kids and with my wife. So I've been trying really to do things with other people. I've been trying post COVID because I haven't seen a lot of my friends to reach back out with them and see yeah. them, connect with them and do the same with family. So all those things, it's not just your physical health. It's also, you know, your personal health, your connections, your family. We all have a chance. So I, I just think that trying to do little things in that way and, 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 and do them frequently um, is really what everybody should be trying to do. Excellent. Yeah. Physical well-being, mental well-being, social well-being, all, all so important. You're welcome at a park it any, any time, Robert. So I hope to see you one soon. Where, where, where can people go to find out more about you and your work? So a lot. So I work in the Beacon Hospital. Um, I have a private practice here, so I'm very uh, findable in that way. But I post a lot on social media, particularly on LinkedIn. Uh, and I use that audience because a lot of that does relate to the corporate audience. Mm. I know a lot of that audience are also on Facebook in a more social way. So I post there quite a bit in terms of habits. Uh, my website's just going through a, a change at the minute to try and reflect more lifestyle as much as cardiology. So uh, that will get announced through my social media. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I look forward to interacting with as many people as possible. Or if anybody wants me to come on board and help you with some of the behavior design and habits, I'm always open to that. Uh, and in fact, that really, really interests me in trying to do that with people. Fantastic. Thank you, Robert. We'll be sure to include all the, the links you mentioned there in the show notes. Thanks so much for your time today. Thank you very much, Brian. I really enjoyed that. And that's a wrap for this week. Go to workwellpodcast.com if you'd like to access the show notes for this episode. Quick favor to ask. Can you head over to iTunes or Google Play or wherever you get your podcasts to subscribe, rate, and leave a review for the WorkWell podcast, it would be a huge help. So thank you. If you want to dive deeper in the area of workplace health promotion, if you want to educate yourself in this area, then make sure to check out the WorkWell Institute. It's our online learning hub. It's a one-stop shop for all your workplace well-being training needs. You'll find all the details at workwellinstitute.org. By the way, the original music that you're hearing right now was composed by my good friend, Greg Clifford. Check him out at gregcliffordmusic.com. Thanks for listening right to the end. Remember to work well, stay safe, and I'll see you on the next episode.